What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Rugby Muscle podcast. I'm your host, as always, TJ. And in today's episode, I'm honoured once again to be joined by my buddy, Dr. James Hoffman of Renaissance Periodization. This guy is an absolute genius, and I'm laughing because I'm pretty sure every time he's come on the podcast, I've said the the exact words, absolute genius, because it's true. This guy is very, very smart when it comes to strength and conditioning advice, dieting advice, and all that good stuff that comes with getting in shape for rugby and for sport in general. It's not just about the studies and the intricacies of the science, but it's also about the real world applications of all of those things. And he does a really good job of sort of like smoothing it out so that it's something that you guys can understand and apply to your training and your life so that you can succeed. Now, this episode isn't just about the COVID-19 being locked down and how we're going to deal with it and all of that sort of stuff, because you've probably had enough of that by now. It's about how to come out of this, because now that we see the light at the end of the tunnel, we can start to make a little bit of a plan. We can start to have a little bit of hope. And even if we can't quite see the light at the end of the tunnel yet, we know that it is there at some stage. And maybe that's all we can cling to for the motivation to stay on your home training regime or to just like get through this. I, I know I know personally I've been struggling where my first week of home training without you know just using body weight and bands and stuff, I was super pumped. I was like, this is a great challenge. And now it's got a little bit you know slower, it's got a little bit more difficult and it's become slightly less motivating because it's not as novel. And I'm like, ugh. So in looking forward and looking to the plan of action once this is all over and how we can implement that and all the awesome changes that we're going to do because of that, I think this ends up being a really good episode. We also give some practical advice for you guys that are new to rugby and haven't lifted and that are new to lifting and have just been a rugby player for all your life. We give you good, actionable strategies that you can use and put in place and be able to get the most out of your training and become the best rugby player really that you can be and get the most enjoyment out of this awesome game of rugby that we will all be playing once this is all over. I hope you guys take a lot from this episode and really enjoy it as much as I did recording it with Dr. James Hoffman. Boom, so we are live once again with Dr. James Hoffman. Dr. James, how are you doing? Awesome to be back. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Luckily, I'm, uh, I haven't been super affected by all the craziness. We went on, uh, got back from vacation, came home, and it felt like it was an episode of The Twilight Zone. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, yeah. Like, what yeah, the yeah. Hell? You would have got like one of the last few flights back or something, right? Actually, yeah, we did get the, the last flight back. I heard this. At right. least from from American Airlines, yeah, we didn't even plan it out that way. It's just like we were just coming home, and uh, we overheard. We we got to Tokyo after connecting. We were in Bangkok, then we connected through Tokyo, and then we were in Tokyo, and the airport's like empty, and we're like, "What the hell?" And we get on the plane, and the flight attendants were like, "Yeah, this is actually the last one out of here for a little while." And we were Oof. like, "Oh shit!" Yeah. <laughs> good, thing we're, good thing we scheduled it. Jeez. Yeah, so it was a little crazy coming home, but, uh, uh, you know, like uh, all the supermarkets were like out of toilet paper and food for a little while, but things are calming down now a little bit over here, so it's not not too bad. They are, just about. I mean, it, it took a minute there. It was, people went crazy, but still didn't lock themselves in, you know, didn't actually shelter in place, but they were yeah. going crazy with bu- just buying toilet roll and, and canned stuff. Dude. I have been without toilet paper for like a solid like two weeks and we finally got some from like eBay. Every time I go, there's just, <laughs> there's just I've been baby wiping the whole time and I don't, you know, like I don't mind a baby wipe every now and again, but your boy needs to be dry. You know, yes. I can't just be wet all day. Come on now. Yes. So <laughs> I, I, I've actually had, I, I had one, I was on my last roll way before all of this happened. It, this was like a Costco um bag or batch that I had that had lasted me like two years and I was on my very last one <laughs> and it lasted me for a good you know it's first few weeks because I mean I had no choice but I also yeah I'm a I'm a baby wiper first so I, I use mine j- more just to dry than to uh clean because yeah it's ugh. It's been a rough, rough go from my butt, but it's the worst that I have to weather for now, then I'm a lucky person, I would imagine. So. <laughs> yeah, that's that's very true. And how, how are things at RP as well? I, I've seen a lot of you guys trying, really trying to help out with the at-home programs and stuff. 
Yeah. So like most of us who work for RP full time, basically like a, you know, lockdown is like 90% of our lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> everyone everyone yeah. else is like, oh, this is so crazy. And we're like, uh, this is just like our normal life. But um, so we've been trying to like put some stuff together for people like uh, my wife, Dr. Wife and Dr. Micah put up like a our training hypertrophy guide from home. And we, we got like the, some at home workout guides and they seem to be doing well, but yeah, you know, like everybody else, we've, we've seen a little slump in some sales on some stuff. It's uh, it's kind of hard to remember that fitness and sports are, are luxury items for us. You know what I mean? It's like if you are, if your if your life is so well in order that you can afford to spend money on fitness and sports, then you're probably doing pretty good in life. And, and that's kind of where a lot of people are at now where it's like, ah, I might be getting laid off on my job. I don't know if I have a lot of extra money for, you know, fancy fitness program. So we're, we're, we're in a similar spot that a lot of people are in. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's weird. Cause it's also like, it's also showing that health and fitness and, you know, not f- from a sporting aspect, but just from a pure health aspect is, is huge. I think we're seeing that now that a lot of these people that are getting affected and the people that are suffering the worst symptoms are people that are out of shape to begin with. And that's not just to be like, Oh, high and mighty Mr. Fitness, but yeah, definitely. Right. So it's, it's definitely not, not helping you at the moment if you were like out of shape. And this is one of those unfortunate situations where the, the most at risk people are going to be those with, you know, adverse health conditions already. If you're old, if you're young, or if you are just not so hot. <laughs> so yeah. it gives definitely good incentive to, to keep up with their fitness. And then at the same time, those that are, you know, in a, in that luxury position where we can treat our fitness just not as just a health aspect, but the health aspect's almost like an aside, but we're doing it for our sport. Some, some of these people are, you know, we're, we're doing, we're doing okay. But at the same time, because we're, um, we have that desire to get better. It's not going to stop just because we're not allowed in a gym. Yes. Um, and you know what? Dude, improvise around it. I was thinking about that the other day and I, uh, I watched an old, like, you know, just like a training video of the Fiji rugby team. And, ah. Oh. You, you think like, oh, I, don't, I can't go to the gym. I don't have my like calibrated Alinko plates. Yeah. I don't have a Prowler. I don't have like, you know, the, what's it? The Kaiser, like hydraulic, you know, but blaster thing. You know, these, these, these fuckers are out there just with wheelbarrows and some like tires and they some, like, logs. are yeah. yeah, like logs, like talking about people who made it all the way to the top. Now, granted they're, they have like the, the genetic blessing, but at the same time, like, if they can become the best rugby sevens players in the world with pretty, you know, some of them don't even have infrastructure in their towns. They don't have roads, yeah. sewage, electricity. If they can make it there, you know, you can probably do okay doing some at home workouts for a little while. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it was definitely like a friendly reminder to like, it's about your perspective and it's about like not finding or making excuses, you know, where it's kind of cliche of course, but like when there's a will, there's a way. And like, you can have, you can be a world champion with, with some wheelbarrows and some logs. So, the rest of yeah. us can do pretty just fine. I mean, Ro- Rocky made it work, right? When he was just lo- stuck up in that mountain. Oh my God. The Rocky training montages were like, when I was a professor, dude, it was like the bane of my existence. What about Rocky? I'm like, it's a movie. It's not real. <laughs> yeah. But mentally, I feel like this is a nice little test for people because every motherfucker would have watched that movie. And actually I, I use the, the one from the dark Knight rises when he's stuck in that, um, when he's stuck in the oh, prison. he's in the prison, yeah. <laughs> and he's just doing sit-ups. He's got a terrible back, but he's just doing a million sit-ups and pull-ups. And he manages to escape. And the amount of people that would have watched that movie and been like, yeah, that's, I would have done that too. You know, I wouldn't have just rotted in there like all these old people that stayed in there forever. I, I would have gone out and saved Gotham. Like, this is, <laughs> this is your chance, right? Except you're not in a prison. You're just stuck at home. And you can right. still go out. You can still go out and use the field and run and... I liked that all those like sit-ups helped him jump further too. That was a little <laughs> overlooked part of that, but whatever, it's fine. He did it. He's bad man, right? Yeah, yeah, right. totally though. Like people, um, it's I don't know. I feel like this is one of those times where um, it's easy to lose motivation, and that's when you kind of have to lean more on discipline rather than motivation. Where you just say like, you know what, this is shitty, and I gotta make I gotta make something happen, and it might not be the best, but like an imperfect something is better than a perfect nothing. So yeah. just let discipline take over and, and try and get some work done here. Yeah. And on that note, are, are there any sort of um, helpful tips that you have for guys that are, because I've experienced this myself because I, I, the first week I just took off because I'm like, right, this is going to be my deload anyway. I'm in a, I'm trying to gain some mass as well. So this isn't really ideal. And I was like, all right, I'm going to take a week. I'm going to rearrange. I went to Home Depot and bought a bunch of bands and bought a bunch of sand. 
Um, and uh, yeah, trying to figure out my own little home gym. But I took a week to sort of get it all into gear. And then I was like, right, this is going to be cool now. I'm actually going to train at home. And my first week, you know, I woke up, I went, I took the dog for a walk and then I, you know, got took care of my training session and it was really good. I was feeling energized. And then got to the end of the week and it got to the second week and I'm like, uh, Ugh. actually this isn't <laughs> as fun as the first week anywhere near, you know? Yeah. Um, and so now, yeah, I'm, I, I'm in that boat where I'm having to rely on discipline. It's getting me through and it's, you know, some, it, and because training is something I've done all my adult life, it's something that I'll always carry on doing, but are there any, are there, have you got any tips or advice for people that are sort of struggling with the motivation side of things? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple like pretty simple things. The first off is like the only thing that you really, that I would say you probably can't do unless you have a pretty equipped like home gym setup is massing for the rest yeah. of us who are not massing. Um, all it's, it's really easy to actually just maintain your muscle mass. That's the really the good news. So if you're cutting or if you're isocaloric right now, you can just keep going with whatever you're doing the best you can and just adapt and modify because the maintenance volume to maintain your mass is so low anyway. Yeah. You can just hit like a couple sessions of push-ups per week and you probably cover most of what, if not all of what you need for chest. Like you can do some lunges around the house. You can do some like modified like sissy squats or some uh, like glute bridges with one leg or some single leg stiff legged deadlifts. You can either grab like a backpack, put some books in there and do some bent over rows. You can do some lateral raises with milk cartons. You know what I mean? Like it sounds silly, but there's plenty of household items and like imp implements and improv improvised things around the house that you can load with a little bit of weight. And it's as long as you can train kind of between like five and 30 reps, uh, you can, you can get plenty of stuff done. It doesn't have to be perfect. And even then, even if you don't have anything heavy enough around the house, you can do like metabolite training or myo rep type training, which is a little more awful and a little more brutal, but it will yeah. get the job done. So I think a lot of just maybe they're focused a little bit and say, you know, maybe I'm not going to get the same training I was getting before. But while I'm in lockdown or while this quarantine stuff is going on, I'm going to shift my goal to just maintaining the muscle mass that I have, maintaining some basic cardiorespiratory fitness, and then I can get back to doing like the hard grind tra of training later on. The only people who are in a bit of a pickle, I would say right now, are kind of people who are competitive athletes, right? Where it's like, okay, the milk cartons and stuff might not cut it, but this, the same kind of idea applies where maintaining the muscle mass is what ends up potentiating gains in strength and power and speed down the road anyway. So ultimately, as long as you can maintain your muscle mass, those characteristics will come back once you start training them again. And it's not a huge deal. It's just a temporary setback. Yeah. I mean, we've seen this in the science in a bunch of different studies where they've taken people and they've just made them do absolutely nothing for periods of time. Um, I think there's there's one on rugby players where they did they did they did three weeks of absolutely nothing and they still maintained all of their strength. So you throw just a little bit of work on top of that, and you'll be fine. And then this is and then you've got all this time that you would have been lifting or or, or doing whatever you were going to do, like yeah, rugby training, any sort of training, and you can put it towards a different component of your fitness. Yeah, absolutely, and that's so that's the really funny thing. Like you know, I've been exploring the volume landmarks idea with Dr. Mike and RP for several years now. And every time we, we look at the maintenance volume, it just keeps getting lower and lower and lower <laughs> in the science. We haven't really hit a bottom end yet where uh, like you can just have people do jack shit for a, a pretty sizable amount of time and they won't really lose much fitness. Now there are, there are some instances like um, skills uh, and cardiovascular fitness. Those are things that can actually decondition pretty quickly. But as long as you're, if you revisit them on some minute, timeline um they come back very fast whereas like muscle mass you really gotta it's probably we usually look at like sets per week and we say okay how many sets per week do you got to do to not decondition your quads or your chest or your back it might be one of those things where it might be like how many sets do you have to do every like two weeks or maybe three weeks because it's so low and then what's really interesting and this should be a big relief to all your listeners too is even if you do decondition and lose muscle mass one of the really cool things that we find is that once you start training again, you re as long as you're not dieting, you basically regain your lost muscle mass almost immediately within yeah. a few like, weeks of training. So it's one of those like, even if worst case scenario, like you do end up like deconditioning and losing muscle, like I'm telling you, once you get back to quasi normal training and eating, it comes back so fast. So it's, it's, it's definitely some light at the end of the tunnel for people who are feeling a little down about their fitness situation. And like you said, you can always 
turn the dial down on one thing and turn the dial up on another thing. If you have people who's been struggling with cardio, like there's nothing saying you can't go out and take a couple more runs this week. Like, you know what I mean? Like you can get out there and yeah. find some, some ways to train cardio or train flexibility, or even you can do some change of direction stuff in your home. Just maintain the feel, the proprioception, the technique of some of the things that you would be doing on the pitch, just modify it a little bit. It's, it's doable. Yeah. And I can also foresee if you're, you know, working on your conditioning and you it's, it, even, when you get back to doing your weights, then you're in better shape to do your weights more effectively. And, yeah, you know, totally. We're going to probably going to see like some really, really impressive, uh, mass gaining transformations over oh, the next oh, like yeah. year or so. Right. Some serious Java action. People are yeah. going like, to emerge just like, it's going to be crazy. But I think most people, I think like, uh, at least people who are kind of in the fitness community, or at least cognizant of like not letting themselves go too much. I think a lot of people took like a week off, like you said, and then they were like, all right, I got to, I got to get something going here. I got to do something. Yeah. And I think that's where most people, most reasonable people will be at, but certainly there will be some jabas emerging very soon. Yeah. But I, I, I mean, particularly with the people that are listening to this, they, they're not going to, I can imagine if you, if you're listening to this and you're three or four weeks into your uh, lockdown or, or isolation <laughs> And you haven't done shit this entire four weeks. You're probably an anomaly. Like, you don't need us to tell you to do stuff. You know, right? Um, you know, I think what gets people too is like the drinking. When you spend too much time at home, it's like easy to be like, oh, I'll have a beer or some wine or you know, drink tonight. And then the next thing you know, it's like, man, I drank like more nights per week than I than I didn't drink this week. You know, <laughs> like what the hell? So I think a lot of people will struggle with that. Um, but that's just a, a quick adjustment. Once you yeah. once once you're busy working, that 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 corrects itself. Yeah. Uh, it's funny you say that. Uh, uh, most of the, my athletes that I've been working with have, have said the same thing, but for snacks, they're just like, I can't snacks. stop snacking. And I'm like, Oh, you know, we need to just work on your basic habits and we can get around that fairly easily again. But yeah. And like my, uh, my wife actually just did an RP, uh, live stream today and so this on that note if you guys get a chance check out regressive underload on instagram somebody somebody asked her a question exactly like that like what do you do when you're having cravings for snacks and she gave like a really good insight into like some some identifying like why you're feeling the behavior can you substitute like those feelings by doing different activities she gave like a really good example she's an expert in like psychology behavior modification i'm not i'm a i'm a derp when it comes to those things (laughs) check out her post uh, she either that or on RPs, uh, she did a really good answer to that question today. I, I was impressed. I'll, uh, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, cool. So people can check that out. It's, it, I think food environment is a big thing for that. I think just yeah. not constantly like, yeah, if, if you've got a bowl of like, I remember when I, I used to have a, um, uh, office share that I would use to do, get my work done. They like in a cafeteria there, there would just be snacks constantly in this big bowl. And I've never been a snacker and I've never been interested in them, but I would walk past them multiple times a day. And I mean, I'm not going to not pick up a couple of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah, that's I, how, how you are. If you're in a house or an apartment with a kitchen, there's there that's got snacks out all the time. Yeah. I think sometimes like some people have to adopt different strategies. Like some people are all or nothing, right? Where it's like, I just don't have snacks in the house at all. Cause I can't deal with yeah. it. Some people will maybe like they'll get that that craving for the snack and then they'll they'll maybe have like a tea or like a diet soda or something else, like replace it, kind of find something else that's less impactful. It's difficult though, especially like I uh I, I feel I don't know, I feel strange in all this because I'm used to like living and working and lifting from home. And yeah. so I see all my friends struggling with this now and I'm like, what do you mean you're having a hard time? This is like how I live my life. And they're yeah. like, dude, you're the weird one everyone else has like a normal nine to five and we have to figure this out. Like, Oh yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> oh, damn it. Am, am I the weird one? Is that what it is? <laughs> I never thought yeah, about no, it. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've accepted that a long time ago. I'm These are things that like when you're like the, when you start working from home or a one Oh one, like setting yourself a calendar and a schedule and waking up at the same time every day and people just, yes. Like, oh, I don't know what day it is. And I woke up at noon. Why am I not productive? <laughs> yeah. And like, why am I having trouble going to bed? You know, at my normal time. Oh, cause you woke up at noon, homie. What are you thinking? <laughs> It's crazy. Funny. These these are very different challenges to what you know. I, I anticipated when I originally first got you to come back on the podcast, we would be discussing. I know. I thought we were going to be ripping on USA Rugby for a while there. Uh, we, we. I mean, we might. <laughs> we might have to. So, um, what happened with them? Oh my God! I was watching the LA Sevens. Uh, coincidentally, I could have just went to it because it's in my backyard, and uh, 
I remember like the last few times I had tuned in on the sevens team, they were whooping some major ass. And then I feel like the last few tournaments, they just haven't quite got it together. Yeah. It's, it's such a, just a, it, it's those little margins. I think with, I mean, in sport in general, right. It's, mm-hmm. You can you can have a really the difference between a, a ridiculously productive season and a ridiculously uh, uh, poor season is very small when you look at all of the small margins that go wrong for you for that to happen. You know, yeah, that's true. And it's it almost could like just, negative compound interest. And it's always it could be like just totally small things like travel schedules got messed up or like they were just like a couple training days got moved and or were not quite where they were supposed to be. And that threw things off for a couple of weeks and it's just silly stuff can come up, you know, throughout a season, especially when you're traveling that much. See, coming from somebody who has traveled a lot for work. Um, I know what kind of toll that takes on me mentally and physically. I can't imagine some of these guys having to do like, all right, we're going out to Singapore. Now we're going out to, you know, Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. And then we're going like within a matter of a week. It's like crazy sometimes. Yeah. Um, I guess, Maybe the rest of the world or, or the other countries are sort of catching them up as well, I think, or the other teams in yeah. terms of that organization or whatever it is. And, and that because the difference between winning and losing now is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, like those little things make the difference. But no, we're not going to rag on USA, especially not the team. We can, <laughs> we can talk about the business and how that's, oof. you know, yeah, by the time this know, podcast it, comes out, it, that their problems won't be solved. So. Yeah, I wonder what they're going to do. We we were talking about this right before we started, but now like now that we brought it up, I'm like, yeah, that's going to be an interesting thing. Like people are going to want to resume rugby once the lockdown's over, but then it's like, okay, well, can practices even resume anymore? Can normal stuff, can normal matches even go on anymore? I don't know. That's probably going to be a huge thing. Yeah, it's we'll, we'll see, but I guess we'll talk about what happens when this is all over. So, cuz that was one of the questions I want to ask you is that when we're transitioning from this period where you know, we're doing some body weight training. Maybe at best we're, we've got a few dumbbells or a barbell, but we, we're, we're doing compromised training, right? For sure. Um, how, how would you prioritize or what would you prioritize when we're get, actually getting back into the gym and we're actually focusing on a, a, a real training block where we've got our normal um, equipment, normal availabilities uh, available to us? Yeah. So the first and most important thing that everybody's got to remember is that you got to start off way lower than what you're used to. Even if you were did, even if you were able to do a pretty good job on lockdown with whatever you had, when you switch back to using like your normal training methods with the barbell, you know, moving with a lot of movement speed and intent, a lot of power and, you know, exerting a lot of force, your body is just not used to that load. You've had several weeks of being off of that. So if you have normally, if normally you'd start a mesocycle saying, all right, we're going to do three sets of eight and I'm going to build up to five sets of eight on whatever movement, like a bench press or a squat, you might just start doing one set of something and leaving quite a bit of gas in the tank on this first week back and ramping up relatively slowly. I think the, the, what's, what I'm kind of worried about is people going um, back to the gym really gung ho. They're like, yes, I've been waiting to get back to the gym. I can't <laughs> wait to bust my balls a little bit. And they're going to go in there and they're going to try and do like a pretty hard or normal workout for themselves and immediately be overreached and then basically be in a, you know, perpetually overreached for the next several weeks because their body was not accl- acclimatized to that training load yet. So what we got to remember is regardless of what you did, the training was significantly less rigorous than what you would normally do, right? We can all agree on that. And that means you've got to shift, you know, what Mike and I call your volume landmarks down quite a bit and start much lower than you would. And you, and so sometimes what I'll do with, with some of my athletes is I'll just have what I call like a return to fitness stage, which is like a two week pre training phase before they actually hit the mesocycle where we yes. just, you know what, we're just going to do two sets of five, you know, like RIR four or like, you know, like 80% kind of, of what you could do. We're going to do like two sets of five the next week. We're going to do maybe like two sets of eight or maybe three sets of five or something like that, just to build a little bit of that tolerance to training again, before we even get into the mesocycle, which will start, you know, conservatively and then progress more normally. So that's my thing where it's like, just start low and build yourself back up. Don't think you're going to come back to the gym and and be doing what you did before because you're just going to get hurt or overreached. And then it's, it's going to prolong the amount of time that you're out of the game. Uh, but you know, you know, so many people listen to this are like, no, I don't care what you say. I've got to make up for lost time. Yeah. The beautiful thing, and this is, man, I wish I uh, had this off, off the top of my head, but they've been looking at um, 
they don't call it in the literature, they don't call it deloads, but they basically look at when you take somebody and you give them an extended period of either like no training or very, very low volume training. And then you compare that with somebody who trains continuously for roughly the same amount of time. So you say like, we've got two groups, one group trains for 15 weeks, the other group trains uh, for also for 15 weeks, but every, you know, fifth week they take a deload. Yes. Um, You basically see equivalent progressions in both groups. So what you lose in time, you make up for generally in resensitization to the training stimulus. So it ends up being a wash over time. So what you are gaining now is resensitization to hard training. So what that means is you're going to get a huge bang for your buck. You're going to have to do very, very well and you'll make a huge amount of fitness gain within those first couple of weeks. And it will be roughly equivalent to if you had been training this whole time pretty continuously. So that's kind of the cool, interesting thing. You kind of, um, it's not the same thing as getting beginner gains, but it's a very similar phenomenon where you get like a disproportionately high rise in fitness from a very, very small dose of training. So basically this time is a good time to be thinking that you're like cultivating desire to train and you're resensitizing your muscles to really, really hard training. And when you get back, you just have to do a very, very little amount. You're going to get a huge fitness payout. And the goal is to stay in the game as long as you can. If you go in there and you blow your load the first week and then now your elbow hurts and now your knee hurts, guess what? That's going to be hurting the rest of the season if you even make it that long. You know what I mean? So just start easy it ends up the time ends up being a blessing in disguise in terms of resensitizing yourself a little bit. And for the most part, anything that you lost is going to come back quick. So there's no rush. There's absolutely no justification to rush back in for the sake of lost time. It's almost like you can't overemphasize that enough. It's so true. People are still listening to this. I wonder how many, cause I know, I know for a fact people are going to listen to this and still go, no, nope, I'm different. I need to train harder. I need to still do this. And you're like, no, yeah. Don't. And that's like a, it's an admirable mindset, right? Like you can appreciate yeah. people who want to work hard, but oh, I get it. it's going to be at your own cost. That's what we're trying to tell you. Right. So it's like, it's like you, you have a great mindset and you're going to be, you're probably going to be really productive because you have so much desire to train, but just keep in mind, like keep a, of that bottled up for now and let it come out later. It's, it's going to serve you in the long run. So you don't want to just waste it right now short term. Yeah. And it's, um, I think the study I, I, I was from, I, I've had to familiarize myself with it because I was trying to tell it to people, but there, I think it was, there was one where they did, I think it was 36 weeks and one group had, I think it was nine weeks on and three weeks off three times. And the other group had the whole 36 weeks and they both got pretty much the exact same results. Yeah. So I think like, and, and usually in those studies, they're looking at like muscle growth, um, right. which is, is, is a good a good example of this idea. So if you wanted to be like really, really nitpicky, you could say, well, there's going to be a difference between like the uh, progress you see in muscle growth and the progress that you would see in um, like skills and tactics because developing skills and developing like knowledge and tactics is something that can happen on a much different time scale and can decondition in a different time scale than muscle growth itself, right? So you could say like, mm-hmm. well, you just need a lot of exposures. Like how do I get really good at any sport? Well, a lot of it's just getting like small, high quality and frequent exposures to skill acquisition and learning how to implement those into gameplay scenarios. And then eventually like transitioning into in more and more intense live play, right? You don't get that unless you get the exposures. And so I think people who are concerned, I would say your concern should be more based in the skills and tactics of your sport rather than the fitness components. So if there was anything that you could do to to better serve yourself in this regard, it would be how can I actually keep my skills and my tactics sharp during this time? Because those are actually going to decondition, right? Whereas your fitness is going to be something that's very manageable. Yeah, I think for tactics, there's there's more rugby than you can watch on YouTube for free. And I'm not, (laughs) yeah, totally. I'm not overly sure of the legalities of all of it, but uh, there is so many hours of rugby that you can watch. And if it's high level rugby and relatively current, you can get a good tactical benefit just from watching it, especially people that are listening that are playing like an amateur level, you know, that you can watch it and you watch it from an aspect of, right, what are their, what decisions are they making? Why are they making these decisions? What were they doing? Well, what are they doing poorly? And, And interpret that into your own game. And, thinking about rugby in that aspect is going to make for so much improvement because especially in the States, it it blows my mind how little, uh, even the higher level guys that play club rugby here in the States watch rugby overseas and watch high level rugby elsewhere and, and understand a tactical component from that. Yeah. It's like, um, 
It's surprising to me too, and I, I really like what you what you said there because it's so true. Just watching, doing chalk talk, doing video reviews is a good way of maintaining the tactical uh, sharpness. Now, it's like it, it definitely won't replace like being in the in the moment, like at a session or a, a scrimmage where you have to respond and predict and adapt to what is actually happening on the field. That's just something that you cannot mimic unless you're you're doing the game, but keeping familiarized with those scenarios, watching how other players respond and adapt to, you know, various things is really important. And um, so what I ended up getting was uh, I got an ESPN plus membership Uh just for rugby. And that ended up working great. I think it's like, I want to say it's like nine bucks a month and they're pretty good. They have, uh, they'll play super rugby. They'll play like the Guinness premier leagues. They'll do some of the international stuff and they'll do a little bit of like the, uh, the semi pro stuff here in the States. So Mm -hmm. if you have ESPN plus, or actually, and that's the same, it's the same as if you have Disney Plus. Like Disney Plus has uh, Hulu, Disney, and ESPN Plus. You can go back and watch a lot of rugby. It's on there. And it's, it's a good, for, for the USA, it's a good way of getting, because your other choice is what? The NBC Sports one, and that one's okay. Yeah, you have, you have the World Cup on the NBC one, and I think you have some other uh, European rugby. But, it, it, I mean, yeah, like you say, just, just keeping your mind sharp is like – now more important than ever and it might be a little bit depressing to watch it <laughs> so i've kind of found as well I'm like, uh i want to try and do this now and you can't but it's yeah. you know maybe maybe you put it on and that's what i've been doing with jujitsu as i've been putting on like high level jujitsu as i'm just doing my workouts and yeah. that way it's just there in the background and i'm looking at it, i'm like oh these are cool things like these are cool entry methods that i could use and i don't get to use them except on my grappling dummy right now but eventually it's at least it's something yeah. And if you have like a quarantine buddy or, you know, like somebody in your household that you, mm-hmm. you can trust, you can like definitely lightly drill those things and just yeah. maintain a feel and like proprioception and just familiarity with the techniques. You're obviously not going to like, you know, hip toss somebody in your house. It's not probably not a great, then <laughs> they yeah. might not appreciate it very much, but you can definitely like rehearse those things in your mind, maintain some feel. I think that's the big thing here that people are probably neglecting. I think everybody is really focused on the fitness component and rightfully yeah. so like fitness is important too. But if you are a, a sport, Sporting athlete, particularly like in rugby, where you have a very big fitness component, you have a very large skill component, and then you have an equally large tactics component, which a lot of sports don't don't have that same blend. Focus on those skills and tactics right now. Find ways to keep yourself physically and mentally sharp in those regards. Even if you if they have like a if there's a field in your neighborhood and you can go kick through some posts, like do something. Something's going to be better than nothing. And fitness will be easy to manage. The skills and tactics are the ones that you really got to keep an eye on. Yeah. And then with the aspect of something being better than nothing, I think that leads us back towards getting back into the gym and getting back into training. And it reminds me of what you said about just going in and just doing a few sets. I remember I, I was out of rugby for, or out of the gym for like two weeks. I had, but I had mono, so I couldn't even eat as well. So yeah, it was, it was dreadful. Um, but I remember I just couldn't wait to get back to the gym once I got healthy again. And I did my first session. I think I did like one set of 135 pounds I think I was I was gonna do five of five I was really built up I was like right I'm gonna get back up to speed as soon as I can I'm gonna do all these things I think I did one set of like 135 pounds on the bench press I think I did one set of 135 pounds just for five on the on front squats and I I think I did a few others where I just sort of phoned it in and I was dead the next day right (laughs) yeah Yeah, it's amazing. Like your tolerance to that kind of stuff goes down so fast if you're not doing it, and it's a, it's a blessing and a curse because you can you can do a lot less and that's good, but you have to do a lot less otherwise you get hurt. Because <laughs> yes. what what would have happened if you went in and did like you know five by five on that I day? You got out of bed. <laughs> yeah, you would have crippled the next day, yeah. and you might have been overreached. You know, for for maybe a week at that point too, and then you got to do more fatigue management. That's just more time away from the gym. So it's, it's definitely worth easing in. You can, the thing is like, you can always go harder later. It's very hard to go, to have to go easier later when you need to, because you're broken, right? That's Mm -hmm. a bad situation. Whereas like making it harder is always a good situation, generally speaking with it, as long as it's within your tolerance. And it it goes back into, you know, people will say, oh, I want to make up for lost time. But if you go too hard, then you're going to lose more time on the back end. Whereas if you actually plan it in the front end, then you're going to be better, right? Exactly. And you'll, you'll be doing it in a way where you're like accruing gains consistently rather than like sporadically. So like you said, on the back end, you'll like weeks from now, you will have gotten a lot better versus like, you know, trying to get a lot better tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So this call, sort of leads us into, I, I, I think it's worthwhile to hear you sort of introduce or reintroduce the idea of um, MEV and uh, 
MAV and, and MRV and, and how they relate to this? Yeah, absolutely. So the, those terms are what we collectively call the volume landmarks. And uh, what, what those basically refer to is this really complicated issue of dose response. So as sports scientists and exercise scientists, one of the things that we look at is like, okay, what kind of performance increases or you know physiological changes can we see per some amount of training stimulus, whether it's like a volume base or frequency base or an intensity base or some combination of all those things. And so the volume landmarks is kind of like the user-friendly way of explaining these mathematical relationships. So at the bottom level, which is strangely enough is my favorite, no one likes this one, but I think it's the most interesting one is the maintenance volume. And that's kind of what we were talking about with mm-hmm. our fitness discussion. And that just basically is how much training do I have to do to not decondition. And you can apply that to fitness. You can apply it to your skill work and your tactics works as well. So all those things, the maintenance volume applies. So what do I have to do to not get worse? And then we go up a little bit and we have the minimum effective volume, which is we call the MEV, which is, okay, there's some amount of training I need to do to actually get better, right? I have to do, there is some threshold of stuff I have to do to actually see some kind of tangible improvement. Mm -hmm. So the MEV is that bottom level of like, okay, this is the least I have to do to actually make tangible improvements in either fitness skills and tactics, right? And so we kind of have a big space in between those two. So there's kind of a dead zone where there's like um, training that is not stimulative enough to create gains, but is enough to do maintenance volume, right? So there's kind of a big space in between. Going up, we have at the top end, the MRV, which is the one that we're generally most interested in. And that's the maximum recoverable volume. And that's the most amount of training that you can tolerate from all of the various training sources that you have. So for rugby, that means all of your strength training, all your conditioning, all your speed, agility, change of direction, all of your rugby skills, all your tactics, scrimmaging, et cetera. How much training can you do before performance starts to stall, go down, or we start to see like overreaching, overtraining syndromes. And so our goal for the most part as sport and exercise scientists is generally trying to find the sweet spot where we start a mesocycle somewhere around that MEV, like that minimum effective uh, volume, and then progress upwards towards that MRV, depending on what we're doing. Now, um, what's interesting is like, uh, we always want to have some kind of needs analysis with our athletes. So it's mm-hmm. easy to say train between MEV and MRV, but there's lots of different scenarios where we might not do that, where we might say, okay, I have a guy Uh, his tackling percentage is like way above everybody else. This guy makes 85% of all attempted tackles. He's really shitty at his, uh, his rucks attended on offense, really shitty at counter rucks on defense and his pass completion's pretty good. His catch completion's pretty good. He scores a pretty good number of tries per game. So we might say like there are different sub pieces within that where we say, okay, I'm actually going to work on more tactics in these upcoming mesocycles to really Mm -hmm. work on making sure my guy's in the right place at the right time. Their rucks attended on offense and defense is not where it's supposed to be. So I'm going to ramp up that training a little bit. And you know what? I'm going to ramp down some of my skill work, like passing and catching because that person's good on it. I'm going to ramp down some of my tackling because that person's already above competitive. So I'm going to put some of those things at maintenance volume so they don't decondition so that I can free up training resources and opportunities to do other hard training, like uh, positional awareness on the field and like ruckus attended stuff like that. So it's kind of, I like to think of it like a big, uh, like a big soundboard where you have a whole bunch of dials and some of them you're going to ramp up. Some of them you're going to ramp down. The idea being there is some amount of training you have to do to make progress. There is some amount of training before you break. We want to be somewhere in between those two zones. Right. more often than that. And I think what you what, is fascinating about this and it's hopefully this is a really good lesson for athletes to learn during this time is like if you can just maintain qualities like the other components so easily it just frees up so much room for the stuff that you do need to improve which filters into the needs analysis that you spoke about yeah and and this this can apply like it's it's more obvious in sports because there's just more stuff going on but it applies very much to like to, to living a healthy fit physique lifestyle. Like right now I actually put my uh, chest training, my back training and my legs, like both sides of my quads and my like hamstrings and glutes on maintenance volume. And I did a mass emphasis for uh, arms and delts. So literally a bro split. It feels so good. Right. So you can imagine like if you're not training legs very hard, chest very hard or back very hard, your recoverability goes through the roof, right? So that frees up a huge amount of resources for you to train other things. Like for me, I have like skinny arms and legs. I'm trying to beef up my arms a little bit. I can train biceps like five times per week, triceps four times per week, delts almost every day at this point because 
all of the other training stuff is at maintenance volume and I can ramp up my training from other areas. So there's, there's health and fitness aspects to it like that. But more importantly, I think for, for your listeners, right, is the idea with sports where it's like, I have a needs analysis. Here's the pros and cons of my athlete. They might be above competitive in some things. They might be competitive in others and below competitive in other things as well. What can I do to make sure that we are cultivating progress in the most efficacious path. That might mean cultivating strength so that they, are, they went from competitive to above competitive. That might mean addressing weaknesses. So if we have something that's below competitive, kind of getting it up to competitive levels and any number of options in between. But somewhere along the lines, you have to have an assessment. You have to have a really good coach or really good mentors. And you have to have like an honest, uh, open discussion with your athlete saying, here's what I think is holding you back from being a premier player. Let's address these things in the upcoming block and see how it goes. We can reassess later. And if we fix it, then we can move on to the next thing, you know, and it's, it's hard. It's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of numbers. It's a lot of bookkeeping, but that's probably the best way to go about training for sports more often than not. And it's one of those things that I think having a coach allows you just to trust that process a little bit more. Cause it's very, you know, people listen to this, like we've already said, they're people that want to do more. They want to work as hard as they can. And to be told that, listen, you're, you're already like the amount of props that I will talk to that talk to me about, you know, how they get better. And I'm like, you're already strong enough, dude. You don't need to be any bigger or stronger. Yeah. You need to get fitter. You're not getting around the pitch. And by the time we hit the fifth scrum, you're already dead. So you're then no longer <laughs> effective. You know what I mean? And yeah. And I think a lot of people forget that there's like an opportunity cost, right? Where they're like, what do you mean? Like strong enough where it's like, okay, let's say you squat, you know, 200 kilos for five, like not too shabby, right? What's it going to take to get up to 220 kilos for five? Mm -hmm. Dude, you're going to have to move heaven and earth in your training to get there. Whereas like, what is the payout that you get from going from yes. 200 to 220? It's like, okay, you're a little bit stronger at scrumming and you can hit a little bit harder now, but you still have the same problem to run out of gas by the fifth scrum, like, the, like you said before. So there's like an opportunity cost too that people forget where they think, why not just take this thing that I, you know, that I like, like strength or whatever, and just keep making it better indefinitely. And it's like, at some point, there's, there's the opportunity cost. And at some point, you have to say, like, is actually getting stronger preventing me from being the best rugby player I can be right now? Or is it something else? And should I address these other more pressing concerns? There are cases in sports where you can take something like if somebody's really fucking strong, and that's what's causing them to win a lot of exchanges, you can cultivate that and say, let's just make you wait. Let's make you in the 90th percentile of strength. And that might carry you yeah. through a lot of things, but it might not either. So you have to kind of know on a case by case basis and situations and, and have other sources of data saying like, you know what? Uh, you actually had like 20 handling errors in the last four matches. Like, why don't we work on that? That seems to be a bigger issue than how strong you are. You know, something along those lines. And that's what, as a sports scientist, those are the things that we, we try to look at and say like, okay, what's preventing you from being the best? Let's look at those yeah. things. And then even probably from a psychological standpoint, it's probably difficult for an athlete to really do the stuff that they, you know, address their weaknesses because it's a big exposure and it's uncomfortable. It's, you know, if you're someone, if, yeah, if you're that prop that's squatting 200 kilos, to be able to be that strong, you probably have squatted a ton and you probably enjoy it or you enjoy the process of it. And if your hands aren't very good, well, then you feel like a bit of a plank every time you're trying to do catching practice and you suck. And that's, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, exactly. it's a hard thing to sort of acknowledge and wrap your head around. And I like what you said around getting the things that you are good at, potentially even looking at getting them even better. So like I see this one as a real good one for wingers because if you're already pretty fast, but if you then became like untouchable, look at USA rugby. We talk about it. Yeah. Arlen Isles and Perry Baker, like they are the best, you know, two of the most threatening rugby players in the world in, in the game of sevens, at least because of how fast they are, because they are just, they've gone from elite to complete world class in just the speed component. And that just separates them from the others. It doesn't matter that they're not as effective as a tackler or a rucker or, or, as such. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And especially like Carlin Isles, it's like, okay, you just maintain all that fitness that you already have. And let's just get you to be able to pass and catch a rugby ball and tackle somebody every now and again, right? <laughs> How hard is that? That's not very hard, at least in terms of dosing. And that's a really an awesome example of like the interplay of fitness skills and tactics. You can choose to cultivate things 
that could result in you expressing tactics that you otherwise would not all be able to do, right? Like you yeah. might, uh, you might have to play a, just a more evasive style if you're not that fast, or if you're really fucking fast, you can just run around people <laughs> like Carlin Isles does. He does it's, he's not trying to zig in and out and be evasive. He's just fast enough to just take an angle and run right around you. Mm. So that opens up tactics opportunities. And there's a really cool um, interplay there. You see that a lot in jujitsu. You see guys who like, uh, who like if you look at somebody like uh, Dr. Mike loves to talk about this. Uh, he's he's a really strong guy, and he adopts his jujitsu game to like a more strength slow style. Whereas other people, you'll see like um, one of my uh, my wife's teammates, Red. He's so explosive, and you, this is a guy doing like cartwheels and flips and all these crazy passing and stuff like that. And he doesn't rely on like a grinding slow strength game. He moves. He's a quick, explosive guy, and he adopts his tactics to his strength, which is like a lot of movement and stuff like that. So it's a, that was a really good example you gave of, of the interplay of those things and how that might affect yeah. how you set up a training block. And then even then, with jujitsu, it ties in even better to when we're talking about the skills and the tactics because Doctor Mike's not getting any better at jujitsu. Because by getting stronger, like that's not improving right. his jujitsu game anymore. Yeah, he'll he'll be able to crush people more effectively. But eventually, somebody is going to get you know keen to somebody who. And I'm not just saying this for Doctor Mike, but like anybody who just relies on one thing, um, whether that's strength or like one particular movement or one particular mm-hmm. skill. Like any other competitor is going to get keen to that and find ways around that, right? So yeah, exactly. He's not getting better at jujitsu necessarily, but he's playing to his strengths and he can use tactics yes. which rely heavily on strength which other people might not be able to get away with. <laughs> but he's not going to be a black belt from getting stronger. He's going to be a black belt from getting better at jujitsu. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. So that goes into what you were talking about before. Yeah, and on that sort of notion, we do, especially in the States, we see a lot of guys, and actually I've got a few guys in the UK that have gotten back in contact with me as well, that they are, they you know, they tune into the podcast because they like rugby, they like watching rugby, and they like fitness. They, they're keen athletes that... Maybe they're transitioning from powerlifting or, or we've had a few from strongman as well, or maybe even from football, but which involves a lot of American football, which involves a lot of grid. I mean, a lot of uh, iron shifting and, and doing work in the gym. Mm-hmm. Um, what sort of uh, component do you think is most important for these guys to work or, or sort of aspect of training? Do you think that these guys should focus their training towards if they're trying to just improve as a rugby player? Because we get a lot of people that come from a powerlifting background and they still still want to stay in that aspect of things. Whereas I think that you can open up a lot more opportunities along the lines of what we were talking about in other areas. And there is a, yeah. what areas would you sort of target? So like in terms of fitness, like the, the obvious one to me, when you have people who are kind of transitioning from like more traditional American style strength sports, like powerlifting, yeah. strongman, stuff like that, American football is conditioning, right? There's a, it's a completely different level that a lot of people who never had that kind of exposure, if they never did like any team sports or anything, it's just like, I'm sure you see this all the time. You get guys who show up to practice, they make it through the warm up, and they're already like sweating bullets and taking mm-hmm. a breather on the sideline, right? So it's one of these things where like you can still maintain a lot of your strength characteristics, if not all of them. And it just is a matter of managing your training volumes a little bit more intelligently and saying, okay, you know, like there's going to be times throughout the year where I'm a little bit more heavy on the conditioning stuff and I'm going to dial my strength training down to maintenance volume so I can build that up and be prepared. Other things to think about too is like, um, again, the skills and tactics, like if fitness is something like in rugby, rugby is one of those unique sports where it kind of has like a pretty even distribution of fitness skills and tactics requirements where you can not be the greatest rugby ball handler or kick or kicker or any of these things. But if you're like a pretty powerful and fit and enduring person, you can, you can pick up a ball off the ground and, and, and blast through a couple guys and make some ground and not make a ton of mistakes. Right. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, you can be very skillful or you can be like a beautiful tactician and any, any combination of these things. So getting a lot of exposure to rugby and like kind of what we were talking about earlier, like uh, watching some film, understanding um, how different player positions might respond in different situations or understanding like why someone chose to do something versus doing something else like why did they kick it out or why did they kick for touch here and not just try and score a try or why did you know like any number of different scenarios it takes a long time to learn this stuff especially if you don't grow up playing rugby um so i would say in terms of fitness is definitely probably the one that you're gonna have to work on the most and then eventually you're gonna have to start thinking about getting just more exposure time to hands on the ball more exposure time to different scenarios and practice and i mean like i can't tell you how many times i've had uh like my, uh, when I was playing on a men's team, 
uh, they'd be like, all right, time for a 22 drop. And half the team's just like, I don't know what the fuck to do. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and so you have like two guys who are like, okay, you guys stand here. They're going to kick the ball. Here's what's going to happen. You know, like it happens. Yeah. And it's just like, if you don't, if you're not exposed to it, uh, it just takes longer. So like learning the game, understanding um, the player positions and understanding the scenarios is really, really important. So increasing exposure of tactics, I think is really important. Yeah. You, you reminded me of a player that came into my team um, towards the end of last year. And he was a, I think he was in the Marine Corps. So this guy is an athlete and he was a high level wrestler. And I remember he, he came up to me after like three sessions. He was like, listen, man, like, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to carry on with this because I don't like sucking at the sport. I don't like the fact that I'm, you know, I'm used to being really high level. I'm as fit as I can be, but this is just, you know, there's so much to sort of, I feel overwhelmed all the time. And I'm like, listen, here's the thing though, buddy, like you've got the potential to be a really good player but just embrace the fact that for the next year and a half or two years, or maybe, you know, if you do, you do all right, maybe one year, you're going to suck. And that's okay because we don't expect you to be a good player because you don't know what this game is about. But Absolutely. you've got time to suck and then understand it. And then you're already a, the, an amazing athlete, right? Yeah, I think, who is it? I think I was watching Adventure Time and Jake said, sucking at something's the first step to being really good at something. <laughs> um, yeah, totally. And that's the thing, like if you are already like a really accomplished uh, person in another sport, like especially like a really f- like high fitness kind of sport, mm-hmm. man, like you're going to transition so easily to rugby. You just got to learn. Unfortunately, learning is something that just takes time. You can't, you can't learn it overnight. Um, I had one of my guys that I was coaching at ETSU, um, his now wife at the time it was his girlfriend she had been on the division one soccer team at etsu and uh she graduated and after there wasn't any major soccer opportunities for her and he was like hey why don't you think about rugby you're already like a star athlete like why don't you make the switch to rugby she made the national women's team in like a year why (laughs) because it didn't take very long to learn some basic skills she already had so much fitness and that fitness carried over so well Right, like same thing we said with Carl Niles. How long does it take to to teach someone uh, to cat, pass and catch a ball? Not that much. How about making a tackle or making a ruck? It takes a little bit more skill, a little bit more time. But these are things that are very, very teachable, right? And um, I think when you have that competitive edge, like when you're used to being really good at something, it is hard. It's a hard pill to swallow where you have to show up and get beat up every now and again. And you take knocks that you didn't see coming and you're like, man, what the fuck? Some guy just laid me out. I didn't even know I could be laid out right now. What is this? But you just got to stick with it and know that like you're going to learn more and more about the game. And that's where that tactics thing comes into play, where I don't think people appreciate like a good chalk talk or a good walkthrough or a good like film session how much influence that can have on a young developing player in their understanding of the game i think and i think in the united states we're the most guilty of this where people show up to your practice whether it's college or men's or women's or whatever and you just throw them into the fire and say it'll make sense later like a couple weeks from now just do the drill and you'll figure it out we're all guilty of that And um, I think what we probably just need to do a much better job of is just saying like, hey, here's kind of some of the rules. Here's the situation. Here's the goal of like the person in this position. Here's the goal of the person in the other position. Here's what this means. Here's the different scenarios that can play out. And here's why it matters in the match, right? Like it's a little bit long winded, but it goes so much further in helping somebody understand what they're doing. Like if they're just doing it because you said to do it, they're never going to develop the learning or the motor learning to do the thing properly. They're just going to be trying to regurgitate what you said. So I think that tactics goes such a long way and is so undervalued. Yeah. We, we touched on that when I was interviewed Dr. Jake Reed about this as well, like just playing games and solving the problems. It's not just about doing the, doing the drill because you're told to do the drill, understanding it in the aspect of everything else. And, even if you're a player and your coach is making you do all these drills, try and actualize it yourself. Try and understand that what, what this is supposed to represent and why you're doing it and focus on that component. Yeah, and that goes so much further in understanding the game right? versus yeah. just like, oh, me see player, me hit player. Like, like okay, yeah, that's part of it, but there's a reason why. Yeah, um, and that sort of leads me into the next question I was going to ask you is that for every one of those players that – you know, is, is fairly new to the game or can do it that is already pretty fit. You've also got those players that are just tactical, I'm not going to say tactical geniuses, but they understand the game at a different level. They try and play a, like all these different things and they do sneaky plays. They, they have a vision. The game sort of slows down when they get the ball, but they look like they've never seen a gym in their entire life. And <laughs> they still get by really well because of the fact that they are that higher level on your tactics and stuff. But, what are some, what's some advice that you'd give to, to, to those sorts of players? 
Yeah. And this is something where like, it depends on what kind of situation you're in. Whereas like, if you're, if you're doing like rec rugby, like men and women's college kind of recreational rugby, you might only practice two or three times a week. And so you're kind of limited in how much time you actually get to do rugby. So you usually have to take the most advantage of it. If you're playing semi-pro or pro, or maybe you're even flirting with the national squad. One thing that you can do is this, you know, have a good rapport and relationship with your coach and say, Hey, uh, clearly fitness is something that I'm lagging in and I need to spend a little bit more time doing fitness. I think we can all agree. Like I'm pretty good in terms of, you know, tactics and skills. Would it be okay if, you know, I took a little bit less time doing practice this week so that I could have a little bit more time to work on fitness. Can we work a schedule where I'm increasing the amount of fitness training that I'm doing and maybe just decreasing a little bit how much rugby training I'm doing so that I'm not broken all the time. And if you can come to them with that idea and say like, I'm doing this for a reason. I'm not trying to get out of rugby practice. I'm not trying to skate, skate on my you know, responsibilities, but there is a point where I just, I can't do what I have been doing and expect to add four or five days of hard fitness training on top of that. That's just, it's not a realistic idea. Mm -hmm. Can I take some of these things down just a tad, but can I, can I leave practice 20 minutes early on some days with your, with your blessing so that I could have a little bit more effort and energy to do some fitness training, you know, the next morning or something like that. And I think if you have a good rapport and a good relationship and the coach understands that fitness is definitely something that's holding you back and given your time constraints, like you just don't have enough opportunities to pursue fitness and they will allow, uh, allow that for you. I think that's a pretty reasonable thing. And I think if a, if a player came to me as a coach or as like the team, like physio or anything and said, Hey, I need to like leave practice a little bit early, but I'm going to lift tomorrow morning and I'm going to focus on really getting stronger or more muscular for this upcoming season. I'd be like, you know what? You're good. You, you, you we're good. We got the to back it up. Everyone knows that you're great. Like you have good stats, like all these things. If you can make a case for it, I'll listen. Yeah. And if you've got the time, then it's one of those things where you just have to be wary of taking too much of a beating in your, in your rugby training. But other than that, just still just putting in that extra time in the, in the gym or where, whatever fitness component you're trying to work on. Yeah. And the good news is too, like if you're, if you're a kind of a noob in terms of fitness, you don't really need very much. Like nope. adding three times a week might be more than enough to get you going for a little while. And then five years down the road, you might have to go up to four or five days per week, but those three times per week will probably carry you for a pretty good amount of time. Yeah. And what about players that just purely are told that they lack size or, or they do lack size? Not, you know, I've had, cause I have a few people that have reached out and they said, you know, I, w- or I would have made the, this uh, national squad or this regional squad but I was told that I'm uh, too small. And these are mostly these are going to be youth, youth athletes. But you can also still see it in games in, with men, men, in men's teams and women's teams where someone just gets a little bit bullied on the field because the fact that they lack some size. How easy is it for them to do some hypertrophy that's actually going to benefit them as a player? Oh, my goodness. So easy. Of all, of all the things you can train for in rugby – hypertrophy is probably the easiest one yeah. outside of like stretching. Um, <laughs> but that's the thing where um, you can, and this is something I actually just did. I'm working on this uh, volume landmarks book and I did like a, a needs analysis and a little case study for a rugby sevens guy. And uh, he had the other problem. He was too fat. Um, but what you can find is definitely you can find normative standards of things like body weight and LBM per position or per like level of play. And this is something like you can do it with math. You can say, yeah, dude, you're actually undersized for making the national squad for 15s at prop or at lock or whatever. You can, you can use numbers and say like at this body fat, at this weight, you are undersized. And that's kind of a fun, good problem to have because the outcome is that you get to eat a whole bunch and you get to do a lot of hypertrophy training, which is sweet. That's the best outcome. Usually it's the other problem where you're too fat and you got to slim down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, So for those players, a lot of it just comes from maturation. Like you said, a lot of the times you get that from young players, like people who are trying to work their, their way up. Maybe they're just coming out of high school or they're um, maybe at college level and they're trying to make a, a better squad. And they're just not that old yet. They just haven't accrued that much training time and they're still physically maturing. You get that a lot. But the good news is, is like if you can get into the gym, focus on the heavy compound movements like your barbell squats, your bench presses, your bent rows, your pull-ups, pull-downs, stuff like that. Spend a lot of time doing like six to 10 reps Add as many sets as you can generally tolerate week to week and kind of build up every every mesocycle a little bit more, a little bit, a little bit more. Gain weight, you know, about half a percent of your body weight per week for, you know, 15 weeks on end. You'll get there and you won't become like a big super fat boy either. You'll get there. You won't put on a ton of extra fat. You'll be pretty jacked and you'll be a lot stronger in the long term. I think one, and I, I'm sure you've seen this too, where a lot of coaches sometimes are apprehensive about players doing that and like bulking up because they think it will make them slow. 
mm-hmm. um, or just think that it'll like permanently make them like in, in like immovable like just like a blob that just can't move. Um, and like, yeah, there's a little bit of a trade off there. Like when you're in your hypertrophy phase, it's going to impede your ability to express things like power and speed. But the beauty of it is that bigger muscle that you now have months from now is actually going to be more strong, more powerful, faster moving than it was before. So it's one of these things where you have kind of a temporary trade-off in some fitness characteristics to do the training itself. So training for hypertrophy in the short term will make you a little bit less explosive, will make you a little bit more sluggish on the field. But in the long term, we'll have a huge massive fitness payout in terms of your ability, especially like if you're a forward, right? In terms of like being able to link up in the scrum, hold your own in rucks and whatnot, and eventually turn that muscle mass into strength and power down the road. So all for that, all for yeah. it. Well, you, you look at the size difference between, because I've, I've been doing it, been a few, done a few trips down memory lane with us rugby watching, and we've watched a few games from like the 90s, and the size differential between oh, players back now. then yeah. to now, yeah. And they're not worse players. They're not less explosive. I can tell you that for, for, for an absolute fact. Yeah, and they've actually looked at some of the epidemiology of differences too, and they've 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 correlated the two, and they said, hey, since the like '80s and '90s, rugby players have gotten a lot bigger and a lot stronger and a lot faster, mm-hmm. and it's largely because of the training. Uh, practices have improved, but we're also seeing more like high intensity injuries from the contacts being so much rougher. Um, so it's something that people are cognizant of, and I'm sure you've seen all the different concussion and CTE protocols that have been coming about lately. And it's, it's definitely like a different game though. It's like, you, even if you watch some of the old like Haka videos of those guys from like, yes. the, like dude, they got a bunch of like little skinny guys. And now you watch the New Zealand team and they're all like seven feet tall, like 250 pounds. You're like, Oh my God, these guys are massive. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's funny to see over time the difference it's so funny to see like the scrums are amazing where they're like they this, they just t- they take three seconds if that and the whole scrum's formed up and they just they just bind up and then they just fucking slam into each other there's no referee call they're just like yep let's go boom and their heads are straight in yeah. it's so bizarre and they're, they're like almost completely upright as they're doing it because they're not they're not really worried about that like, there's not the technique there's not the big wrestling battle that there is now in rugby in the scrum it's so funny to watch yeah even from the time when i was playing like the scrum cadence has changed so much and i think it's probably one of like a lot of people were kind of poo-pooing some of the changes the last i don't know five ten years but i think it's probably for the better overall what do you think about that yeah i I like it i like the fact that it's a it's a because the scrum's always been a part of rugby and it's not just to reset the play it's a competition in itself and it's one of like i do think as like a rugby purist the scrum is one of the iconic parts of the game so to have that be a, a still that should still be a centerpiece of the game and a, a contest that you can win penalties and you can win games from just having such an you can have a really successful team from just having a, a good pack and a good dominant scrum. Absolutely. I mean I, yeah, that I doesn't think, go on. I was just saying, like I think lately too, we're just I've seen a lot less um you know, like a lot less silly stuff where like the scrum's collapsing or people are getting unbound. It seems like even though the, there's been a lot of cadence changes, it seems like it seems to be a, a very stable and reproducible thing now. Whereas like, I remember when I was playing, it, you'd see it, it felt like there was always a lot of scrum errors and they would, all right, restart, reset. Yeah. Reset, you can lose reset. like five minutes just for one scrum to get set. Yeah. Is, yeah. I know what you mean. There's a balance there, but I mean, every sport has its shortcomings and I think that you ha- they're doing a, a good job of figuring it out. Yeah. I think so too. Because it does, it does need to remain a competition. And now, um, last question. I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but the last question I have here is leaning towards what you were saying before about the, the collisions and the impacts and um, the you know just the overall beating that a, a body is going to take through from rugby. But we've got a lot of guys that are in you know they're, they're in their late thirties. Some of them are even in their forties, and they 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 still get as much enjoyment as they ever have, if not maybe more. And because they've played the game for a few decades now or a long time now, they have that. They have a bit more tactical now than they ever have done before, and they still want to carry on playing. What advice would you give to those guys that just want to hang in there? They maybe maybe they even want to put on a little bit of size, or they want to get fitter, or they want to improve themselves physically from a fitness component. What what would you have those guys sort of work on? You know, I think one of the first things you have to get with some of the older guys is a little bit more freedom and a little bit more autonomy with the coaching staff and then to auto-regulate what they're doing a little bit more. When you got guys who have been playing on the squad or been playing, you know, seriously for a long time, I think it's important to let them have opportunities to say like, hey, you know what? 
I gotta, I gotta ease up on this drill or I gotta, maybe I might maybe even sit this one out or I might, you know, I might leave a little bit early today just because I, I'm kind of having a rough balance with all the stuff going on. And I think that's really important. And I think auto-regulating kind of their, their fatigue and exposures, but also auto-regulating the quality of their sessions where uh, there's a lot of things like, especially in the skill and tactics world where having somebody do an hour of a particular drill or a skill and they they are no longer showing performance improvements and maybe even showing like performance degradations. There's no point in having them continue to do that. They've already exceeded like the dose of that session and maybe are even getting into negative returns. So Mm -hmm. one of the things that we would say with our coaching staff is like, let's auto-regulate some of these older guys a little bit more. So if you see that like they had a good like 15 minutes on the drill and they looked good and things got better and they were doing what they're supposed to do. And then by 20 minutes, I'm not even saying you should be doing the drill that long, but let's just say like by the 20 minute mark, they're kind of just, you know, clearly uninterested or maybe they're not doing as well as they were. You know what? Just have them take a water break and come back to the do the next one. And if other people are still being productive, then let them be productive. And, you know, start treating the team more as um, individuals. And it's hard to do that. It's hard when you got, you know, a squad of 30 people to have basically 30 individual training sessions. And that's when you have to give it back to the athlete and you say like, hey, mate, I trust you. Like, you know what we're doing here. You clearly understand the game. You understand what I'm trying to do for you. You just got to let me know, like if your head's in the game or if you're feeling good, you're feeling fresh, you're feeling productive. Great. Stay in. If you're not hop out, take a rest and come back and we'll do something else. So I think that's a good one. And then after that, I think it's just a matter of uh, assessment at some point. Like that's the thing. Even if you're an old, an old boy, you know, by that mean, you need to get 35 now. Right. But, uh, if you're somebody who's been around, you still have to do an assessment every now and again. It's still good to look at your strength, look at your speed, look at your conditioning and see like, how well do I stack up with my competitive group? Because it's something that can fall to the wayside. And if you don't, you can't assess it if you don't measure it, right? That's the problem. So you should still have some assessments built in. You should still have a a sit down with your coach at least once a year and say, Hey, I'm clearly doing okay in these areas. What do you think? Um, I don't think I'm doing so good in these areas. What do you think? Is this something that we should, I should focus on training and see and get feedback and have a good discussion. I think that's where we're going to see like really, really productive individualized training programs. Whereas like when you have a bunch of beginners and intermediates, sometimes you kind of have to crack the whip a little bit because nobody yes. knows what you're good or bad at yet. We just don't know. You just got to, you kind of have to, I don't want to say put them through the ringer because that's not what I'm trying to say, but you do say like, you know what? I'm going to be a little bit more authoritative on my coaching style with, with some of you guys because we just you don't have enough experience yet. And so we're going to figure that out. The older guys, you let them, you give them a little more autonomy. That's, um, it's Ashley Jones, and this was mentioned on a podcast before, but it's something that I've paid attention to for a few years. And I incorporate my my older athletes that I have, especially the ones that I coach for just one-on-one. Like they, They'll just check in with me every few weeks as opposed to, my younger guys, I'm like, I need to hear from you every week. I need to make sure that you're doing this stuff. I need to make sure you're improving. But it's the you have like the four stages of athlete. Like the first, the first stage is those newbies, those youngsters that you're just like, listen, you're doing what I say. Don't worry about whatever yes. per- this person on Instagram is doing. Don't worry about it. You're just doing exactly what I say, and you're not even thinking about it. Then, as they get older, you know, they they, they can ask a few questions. They can have a few thoughts and give you a little bit of feedback and. But still, it's it's your you're in charge. And then by the third stage, they they sort of have a good idea, but they'll consult with you, and you, you'll put more of a plan. You know, you, you it'll be more of a back and forth. And then by the fourth stage, you're almost there just as a consultant that to bat their own yes. ideas off of. Yes. And yeah, yes. that's it's funny totally. that it's so funny. It doesn't matter the people, the background of the people I talk to about this stuff. Everyone really does hammer it, hammer home the same things over and over. And it's it's funny. It makes for I, I hope this doesn't make for a boring podcast because the, 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 I, I do find myself repeating myself a lot, but I think it's because this stuff is the most important stuff and it's the systems and how they adapt as opposed to how you do you know, all the different tactics that you can use within those systems. No, I totally agree. And like, sometimes it might come off as repetitive or redundant, but there's so much like stupid clickbaity shit. Like, look at this, look at this, like fun, sexy, new, crazy, crazy thing. Right. Where the reality is, it's like, it's good to hear the reaffirmation of things that you know, because then, you know, you're not crazy. You know, it's not just like some old guy who's never been on a rugby pitch before who sits in a laboratory, right? Like you hear the same things over and over again, probably for a good reason. And I think one of the things you, uh, you have to remind some of your athletes is like, no, you're, we're going to follow the status quo here unless there is a good reason not to, right? Yeah. <laughs> in many cases. So I, 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 I feel you sometimes like we, we kind of repeat the same things over and over again. Like 
get, you know, get stronger, get fitter, do, work on your skills. But it ends up, those are the most important things. The simple things end up being the most Yeah. And, and, and also, if these things have stood the test of time, there's a reason for it. Yes. You know, whereas if there's something that's, you know, if there's something that's just been posted on Instagram today, then there's a good chance that tomorrow it's not relevant. Whereas if something, you know, super training has been around for forever, it seems like, and it's still probably the most valuable textbook you're ever going to read on how to train for sport in any way. Yeah, definitely. It's like there are things that are tried and true and should be cherished. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, cool. And with that in mind and with the fact that, we, you know, um, I feel like I've been repeating myself on this podcast a fair bit over the few the last few weeks, you have a Q&A that you do every single week and have done for years now on RP+. Plus. Do you want to plug that and tell people how they can join and yeah for sure so uh, rp plus we have a whole bunch of like content all things like kind of diet fitness hypertrophy sport related um dr mike and i do a weekly webinar series every week and we post it on rp plus and actually they're on youtube now so if you just go on the renaissance periodization youtube you'll see all of those and people can write in questions and we just do you know kind of like an hour to two hours of q a every week and then I actually just started doing a new one. I've only done like one episode, isn't even posted yet, where I actually am going to start tackling kind of the more sports specific questions that people have. So if people have yeah. questions about like rugby or powerlifting or weightlifting, um, I'll tackle those. I actually just did, uh, so the one I did this week was on arm wrestling. So I did Q&A for a little while and then somebody had an arm wrestling question. So I did like a quick kind of training program breakdown of how I would do an arm wrestling situation. And then I ended up just doing another episode because I was so into the idea of arm wrestling. I was like, I want to keep talking cool. about this. So uh, yeah, you can check out the basically uh, the Renaissance Periodization YouTube and Mike and I are on there every week. So you can see us there. Is, that, is it just about getting a really strong rotator cuff? So I, that's what I wasn't sure about. So I did like a pretty, I did like a quick and dirty needs analysis. And it turns out the pec is uh, much more important than I had realized. There's a lot of pec action in there, but certainly, yeah, like a lot of the shoulder muscles, the internal external rotators seem to be important and uh, <laughs> forearm flexors. So I learned a lot about arm wrestling in a short amount of time. It was fun. Yeah. And for the listeners, I thoroughly would advise RP plus as a, a really, really good resort. All right, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed that episode of the Rubber Muscle Podcast, then I've got a quick little request and a potential prize giveaway for you if you do said request. All I want you to do is go to Apple Podcasts and type up a five-star review. Just your general opinions of the podcast would be great feedback, but also helps us reach higher rankings, get more exposure, allow me to attract more guests and devote more time to developing a better all-around podcast experience for you. All you have to do once again is go and give us a five-star review on whatever podcast service you use let me know you've got it and then every single week i'll be selecting one review to give away a free prize that free prize will be either one free month of team rugby muscle that's our world-class shank condition program app delivered directly to your phone or if that doesn't interest you then we've got one free consultation where i'll, I'll go over your training program your nutrition and advise you how to best plan for your goals even if none of those things interest you, it's still doing me a solid and helping the podcast grow by going and giving us a five-star review. There's no real excuse. It takes like one minute and that helps the show out exponentially. So I'd really appreciate if you could do that. Thank you guys so much for listening. I'll see you in the next one.